This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Thank you, Harry. Our second speaker will be Mario Molina, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995 for his work in atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formulation and decomposition of ozone. Mario grew up and attended elementary and high school in Mexico City. He got hooked on science while in elementary school when he first looked at paramecia and amoebae through a toy microscope. This led him to convert a home bathroom into a laboratory where he spent hours playing with chemistry sets. By the time he was 11 years old, he had decided to forego pursuing a career as a violinist in favor of becoming a research chemist. That's foresight. After high school, Mario earned his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at UNAM, the Autonomous National University of Mexico. He then studied at the University of Freiburg in Mexico, in Germany rather, for two years before returning to UNAM, where he started its graduate program in chemical engineering. Realizing that he needed to pursue his education further, Mario enrolled in Berkeley's physical chemistry program where he earned his PhD in 1972. He then went on to UC Irvine as a postdoc to work with Sherry Rowland, with whom he would share the Nobel Prize in 1995. Their work shed important light on the impact on the ozone layer resulting from the release of chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere. Mario was appointed to the faculty at Irvine in 1975, but in 1982, he moved to the Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech so that he could spend more time conducting experiments with his own hands. While at JPL, his work contributed substantially to our understanding of the loss of the ozone over the South Pole. In 1989, Mario moved to MIT, where he continued to work on atmospheric chemistry. Fortunately for us, in 2004, Mario came to UCSD to join our Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and he continues to work on air quality and climate change issues. At the time he moved to UCSD, he also established the Mario Molina Center for Strategic Studies in Energy and Environment in Mexico City, which has a primary focus on addressing the problem of air pollution and improving air quality. So please join me in wel welcoming Mario Molina. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you for, I'm supposed to be 20 minutes, I'm going to try to stick to that. And uh, for a moment I thought I was going to have a very challenging time talking about science with the economics uh, uh, PowerPoint, but fortunately I think I recovered that. Uh, well, I'm going to... To, just to try to tell you about the uh, research that led to the Nobel Prize. But I'm going to start going back in time a bit further. I wasn't born at the time that the, this slide represents. It was born a little later. So this is about a hundred years ago. What happened then? Well, uh, something uh, very interesting happened with, with uh, refrigerators just about a hundred years ago, namely that these electrical machines were developed. Before that, people used to have freezers or refrigerators at home, that, but they worked with big chunks of ice. I know in Boston and in New York and so on, there, there were some big business importing frozen chunks of ice from frozen lakes. And I wonder what was the situation here in San Diego. I don't know. It must have been hard to, to have these machines. But anyhow, this was very nice uh, that uh, 
electrical appliances came to being. Uh, however, these uh, early refrigerators did have a problem, and it was uh, the following. Occasionally they failed and they leaked. And so there were a few bad accidents, in fact, uh, some people actually died, because the refrigerant that uh, was uh, uh, make these uh, refrigerators work uh, was something like sulfur dioxide or ammonia. These are poisonous gases. Okay. So something had to be done. And fortunately, uh, chemists helped to solve this problem. And they developed what uh, for many years was uh, understood to be miracle chemicals. Okay. They, uh, they have this long name, chlorofluorocarbons, but CFCs for short. These are industrial chemicals. They do not exist uh, naturally. But essentially what they do is replace these uh, poisonous uh, refrigerants. Uh, these are uh, compounds, the, the main property that makes them useful for uh, uh, refrigerants is that they, you can convert them readily from liquids to gases at the, at the appropriate temperatures. That's the first property. And the second property is that they, they are very inert. You can breed them and uh, you certainly don't get poisoned. Because of that, these miracle chemicals, of course, were a big success, not only with uh, refrigeration, but they also began to be used as propellants for spray cans. And spray cans became very popular, in, in, again, in the first half of the century. So at some point in time, I remember statistics that uh, a typical household in the United States had something like 30 or 40 different cans spraying everything from toothpaste to underarm the other and to what have you. But the point is that you're, you're going to breathe the propellant, which is the, the idea is to have a compound that under a little bit of pressure is a liquid, so you can have a lot of it in the can, and when you press the, the valve, the liquid evaporates and carries with it the deodorant or whatever you need. So that's where our story really begins. Uh, there's one more uh, point here that uh, to mention is that these compounds being so stable, they were, because of their use, they were just being released to the atmosphere. So it became possible to measure these compounds. And so this is the, um, a graph here of a, a set of measurements by a good colleague of, of ours who developed a machine that was able to measure very small amounts of these compounds. And he found them, as expected, not only in the northern hemisphere, but also in the southern hemisphere. Very small amounts. So it's at this stage that, uh, together with my colleague Sherry Rowland, when I finished my PhD at Berkeley in very fundamental chemistry, I decided to, with Sherry to do something applied. To use. He was also not a, an atmospheric chemist or environmental chemist, but we both decided to see whether we could uh, sort of apply our knowledge to some, something closer to uh, a societal problem. And we decided we would learn about the atmosphere by choosing a problem. If we could solve a problem connected to, to chemistry and to the atmosphere, that would be a good way to learn about it. And the problem that we chose was fairly simple. What happens to these compounds that were piling up? Is there anything to worry about, or will they pile up indefinitely? Uh, at that time, we didn't know that actually several other research groups uh, had asked the same question, and they concluded essentially that nothing would happen. We came to a different conclusion. And to explain what the conclusion is, we just explain very briefly some of uh, the, the most important property that describes the different layers of the atmosphere is temperature. It's graphed here, but I can merely explain it. As you know, temperature drops as you go to higher altitudes, which certainly know as you go to mountains and so on. It, it gets cooler and cooler because of the fundamental physics that the air parcel, as, as it rises, it expands and cools and so on. But this cooling doesn't continue 
indefinitely. In the, the, at some stage, the, the atmosphere begins to warm up, so temperature starts to increase. And that's what defines the second layer. The bottom layer is called the troposphere, the next layer is called the stratosphere, and that's a layer where temperature no longer decreases. It increases, and because of these profiles, they're uh, sort of separated, they're not, they don't mix with each other very, very rapidly. Well, th that's all we need to know to uh, address this, this problem. What we found what appeared to be a little boring at the beginning is that these compounds, the CFCs, piling up in the lower atmosphere were indeed so stable that uh, nothing would happen to them at these low altitudes. Normally, uh, species are emitted by uh, pollutants or natural, so most of them are removed, for example, by rain if they are water soluble, or they get oxidized, they suffer some chemical reactions and they get removed in the lower atmosphere. But these species, because they were designed to be very stable, they actually survive, penetrate into the second layer, the stratosphere. Now, what happens is the reason that temperature increases at those altitudes is because there is a certain compound at those altitudes that absorbs energy from the sun. And this compound is ozone. Okay. It's uh, not very abundant, it exists uh, even where it's most abundant, only at parts per million level. But actually life evolved in the presence of this ozone layer that exists in the stratosphere, uh, because otherwise radiation from the sun would have destroyed molecules for life, like DNA and so on. So we have a pro natural protection that uh, allowed uh, life to evolve and so on, which is the reason why you have this inverted temperature profile up there. Well, what happens then, with, with all this background, I can summarize then what our finding was uh, in, in relatively simple terms. Again, to repeat it, these compounds release at the surface, they mix rapidly uh, in the lower atmosphere. It takes them much longer to reach the stratosphere, at least a decade or two. But eventually, in the stratosphere, they move to the middle or above the ozone layer. And then they find this radiation from the sun that fortunately doesn't reach the surface, the one I was alluding to that destroys biological molecule. Well, that radiation also destroys the CFCs. So that's what happens to them. That's where they end up being destroyed at these high altitudes. So that, that answered the question that we posed, but didn't, we didn't quite stop there. 